Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had a, a, an enjoyable lunch and plenty of networking, uh, made some new contacts and followed up on ones you have already. Um, so we're, we're leading into uh, this particular session, which is looking at the holistic, in other words, all-embracing cybersecurity for operational technology in critical national infrastructure um, and operational technology uh, sort of more generally around real-time control. Uh, in, in those applications. So I'm giving a brief keynote. I'll try and keep to time. And then we've got a, an expert panel uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing from. And I'll introduce them at the end of the talk where I think I've got names in my slide set. So critical inf infrastructure uh, is in those sectors and indeed others, depending on the, the nationality uh, or the nation you're, you're looking at. Um, but these are some of the ones that the UK consider to be important. Um, energy supply, obviously, uh, the utilities, distribution of energy, um, earth electricity, gas, and so on, but also increasingly the distributed generation of electricity uh, using renewables, for example, wind farms, are they adequately cyber protected, PV installations, PV farms, and so on. Um, some of the work we've done uh, within UCL and within Petras have, has looked particularly at water as an industry, so looking at that from a variety of lenses, we mentioned socio-technical before, and in this particular case, uh, including the culture of cybersecurity in, in various operational technology contexts, which is a really subtle thing. Um, we have a research student, uh, Stefano, who I think is here this afternoon. His work is focused on that. So, for example, the way in which organizations view safety and security can be quite different, uh, depending on which sectors they're in. Uh, I'll come back to that. So, in terms of uh, other critical areas, so transport, Obviously, railroad, air, and water have the operators have different perceptions and capabilities and competencies in those areas, and the panel will represent more one or more of those sectors. Uh, again, often in those sectors, you see safety as being a critical factor. Uh, for example, in rail, uh, but maybe security and cybersecurity is a fairly newcomer to their thinking. Uh, communications we heard from Mike: the security of uh, cell towers, the security of the communications infrastructure in terms of its linear assets like fiber, for example, and line of sight communications. And financial services has to be included as a critical infrastructure as well, uh, because we all, de all depend on that, you know, that our ATM machines continue to work. Um, there are various technologies as well as behaviors that pertain there. And one of the technologies, for example, again, uh, that I will mention, Innovate UK have been supporting is digital security by design, where we're, they're looking at architectures and hardware that can support uh, more secure uh, systems like financial services and others. And the final line there, a social technical approach is really important. If you isolate one from the other, you really are missing the picture. A lot of issues and events and malinterventions can be laid at the door of you know, humans not being trained properly, not having necessarily the right information. Um, cognitive overload, I'll mention a bit later on. Um, and I'm just quite interested that my screen just did a wipe, <laughs> but I think we're okay. Um, so the generic features of operational technology in, in, in critical national infrastructure are operator uh, and in infrastructure generally. Um, I've borrowed the picture here from uh, Garland Technology because it was a nice multi-layer picture which shows the physical layer, the intelligent devices, systems, operating systems and logistics at the top. And you often and typically do have an enterprise layer, which is kind of the office system where people are at desks doing the main business enterprise. But right down at the bottom layer, you've got the things that are doing the control for building management, for example, temperature, ventilation, lighting, etc. cetera. Um, and in good practice, those two would never necessarily meet. But in certain ethical hacks, which IBM did, they uh, demonstrated that they are typically connected, often by contractors who like to sit at a desk in an office to tune up the uh, building management system, and of course, once you've opened the door there, then enterprise data can leak through into the operational technology area, which may be less well protected. The other feature there, I guess, is that you have a cyber physical situation because everything that interacts with the real world is inherently physical, whether it be an actuator or a sensor, and that can be tampered with, or it can be uh, otherwise spoofed, for example, or new devices can be introduced to the network. So as we, as we move from wired systems to IoT systems, radio communications, those problems become uh, even more profound and, and there are bigger attack surfaces. So other areas there you can see, we've got human-machine interfaces, uh, we've got people of varying levels of training, 
Um, there was an instance that many of you will be aware of, I think a water company in the US detected an intervention where a hacker was dosing the water supply with a chemical, um, fortunately caught it on the human machine interface and, and trapped it out. Um, but there are many in instances where perhaps that is, is a risk surface. Digital controllers come in different flavors, programmable logic controllers in industry, industry 4.0, uh, building management systems in buildings. Uh, the level of intelligence of those is constantly increasing and uh, I'm told that BMS now typically are building in artificial intelligence and other systems that improve and optimize the performance of buildings. Obviously communications channels and, and the architectures are multi-layered. I think with the BMS typically three layers, looking for Nilla for, for a nod. Uh, but obviously in, in industry, uh, rather more layers uh, are typical. So I think the, the emerging features of operational technology are these, and many of these, of course, have been covered by Petras projects. We're really interested in emerging technology and the impact of emerging technology on usage and behaviours and risk in the operating environment. So the simplest, I guess, is data reduction at the edge, and there's a a good example, uh, I think from Behringer, who were uh, a startup uh, helped by Census in Glasgow, where they have a video system, looks down from the ceiling, a bit like a smoke detector, and counts the number of heads in a room and sends that out as a low, band, low bandwidth bitstream, essentially. So it doesn't identify people, but it does count the number of people in a room, which is really interesting if you're a freeholder renting your space, is it being used sensibly? Or if you're a transport operator, how many people are on the platform? Uh, but it does respect privacy because it doesn't identify people, just the top of your head, basically. Um, we, when I was at BRE, the building research establishment, we had them come present to us, and they were able to show us actually live trajectories of those heads as well, which they didn't actually offer as a service at that time, but you could see people by well, the top of their heads moving through the space, which was very interesting. The next step, I mean, that uses pattern recognition at some level, uh, the next level really is decision support through machine learning and how much agency we give to machines over a human operator, maybe to deal with cognitive overload. And, and again, a classic example of that was Three Mile Island. That's going back a few years in the nuclear sector where the operators were deluged with valid information, but they just didn't have the capacity to, uh, to absorb it and to interpret it. And similarly, uh, in flying, I guess, you have a similar situation if you have an emergency on the flight deck. You need to be trained to understand what the key issues are. And machine learning can help, but also add risk, I guess, to that uh, through being brought in to simplify the interpretation of those events. Um, of course, as soon as you bring machine learning in, then you have to think about training sets, think about bias, think about subversion of training sets. So a hacker could get in there and alter the training set so that in the event of an emergency, the wrong thing happens. One of the, one of the ways that... Um, a number of people are thinking about, and, and also colleagues in, in the audience, are resilience through re reflexive ride-through. So if you can actually disconnect from the internet but have sufficient control remaining around the critical asset, then you've got a way, provided you can detect the intervention, you've got a way of uh, continuing to operate and maintaining your, your, your process. An area that is really interesting, I think, in these, uh, these areas, I, uh, in this domain, because I suppose the incidence is currently quite low, although in building management systems it's higher than in industrial control systems, is detecting anomalies in the behaviour of the equipment that you're uh, controlling by monitoring various uh, properties of, of the, the equipment dynamically. People have used machine learning, they've used models of typical operation, learned through... Uh, normal runs, if you like, of operation and looking for differences. And there's quite a wide area of research and potential development there in looking at anomaly detection. Once you've detected the anomaly, it may be something you haven't seen before, in which case you can catalogue it, put it in a library, and then next time you see it, you might have more uh, protection. Dynamic air gapping sort of comes back to that resilience through reflexive ride through. Again, if you're confident you've, you are being attacked, but you're still operating, you can then open any link to the internet. And one of the areas of research, which again, one of uh, uh, my research students is working on um, in, in the audience, and I think uh, Jamie Tooth is here, someone was this morning, is secure data exchange with digital twins. So mentioning what we said this morning, so a digital twin is some form of model which is updated at an appropriate rate from real measurements. Um, and Sheffield University have got a really easy to read definition of that. Um, so, as I usually say, you know, if you're monitoring a, gl a glacier, if you've got a digital tool of a glacier, you probably measure it once a week. If you're monitoring a machine tool, you might measure it every millisecond. And somewhere in between, if you've got a digital twin of a building or a district, you have a variety of update rates. But 
wherever you've got updates, you've actually got communications channels, you've got commu communication packet assets and the sources of those uh, assets as well, the sources of that uh, digital communication. Uh, and we want a way of dynamically permissioning that information so that when it hits the model, A, the provenance of it is established, but also the people who can see it can be altered in real time by the, a strategy which might be defined by an ontology for security around that model. So you can imagine uh, for a building, there might be a time when you need to see almost everything when you're building the building, but when you're operating it as a facilities manager, you might not necessarily want to expose to uncleared people certain areas of the building, and those could be uh, greyed out or redacted in a way that isn't immediately obvious, so you don't want to make it obvious what you're actually hiding. So that's a really interesting, very live and really quite hard research and practice problem. Um, and, and Jamie's looking at it from a sort of viewpoint of BIM, build, building information modelling, uh, and then moving that into a more generalised digital twin environment. So again, I mentioned um, some of the other research that Stefanos is doing. Um, Socio-technical factors are really important, and, and I guess it was a real eye-opener to me. I hadn't really thought. My background is I was in industry. I worked originally as a designer of control systems for industry, uh, so I've actually got my hands dirty in that area. And I didn't really think of humans in the loop particularly, other than the human interface, make it easy to program. Um, but actually, the socio-technical factors are critical in ensuring security, and, and we'll be familiar with many of, of these. So operational management support is absolutely essential. If, you know, the main board don't believe this is important. It won't happen. We're all aware of phishing attacks, getting ever more sophisticated through, again, machine learning applied to spoofing real humans. The old hoary example of unauthorised memory sticks. Um, I remember my time in government and how you know, that was absolutely a fireable offence to try and do that. So, but it's, it's very, very tricky. And I was told, I think, at a call yesterday that Rolls-Royce actually hot glue over the USB ports on some of the machines to stop people being tempted to do it. There's a, a, the cognitive overload is another issue which I've dealt with already. Another is really training exercises. Have we done cybersecurity training? Yeah. And, and many of us do this in our organisation. I know that UCL runs it, and it's as, as good as it, I guess it, it can be at the present state of the art. But it's very much, you watch a short video, and then you have some test questions, which you remember for half an hour, uh, and you tick some boxes at the end of it. And I think we have to be, it has to be much more behaviourally oriented in terms of one's real received beliefs to make it really effective, so that when you're in your job and, you know, there's a particular cyber threat, maybe a phishing attack, you don't have to think about the right thing to do. You, you would do it by instinct, which is coming back to the last point, which is living the beliefs. Uh, and I worked previously in BOC, the gases company, where we had a lot of security, uh, safety incidents. And we brought in uh, DuPont, the safety consultancy, as well as a chemical company. And they instilled in us, it was a really in-depth program, that you have to live the safety culture, like holding the banister rail when you go upstairs at home. You know, it's, it's a, a thing you really have to make your whole life, if you like, around. We haven't done that with, say, with security, I don't think, in the same way. So a sort of final uh, reflection, I guess, leading into our panel. The IT environment has got strong professional appreciation of cybersecurity, I would assert. I mean, some of you may disagree with that. Um, and by IT, I would say enterprise technology generally. They have a pretty high incidence of attacks. You know, you see them in the press every other day. Many of them aren't declared because of shareholder confidence. Uh, but it has been es estimated, uh, you know, of the order of 400 billion worldwide, the, the cost of those. And cybersecurity is seen critical to their business, banks, for example. I mean, if you lose confidence in a bank, then it's obvious how you feel about it. Um, reputation and client confidence. But in the operational technology environment, the drivers, particularly for the operatives, the technicians and engineers, is keeping the system going and service level contracts, essentially. Um, they've seen relatively low incidence of cyber attack. So actually, why would they worry about it? And there's been some sort of tension, according to interviews that uh, we've, we've conducted, that uh, there's tension between the IT community within an organisation and the operational technology because the operational technology people think that it's, you know, doing all this stuff is, is diverting them from their main job, and that's, that's an issue for them as a distraction. So the real question, which we are trying to answer through any PhD thesis, is how to embed that robust security culture in OT environments. Interestingly, they're very aware of it themselves. So even on a mission I did to Japan with Innovate UK recently, Japanese companies were similarly aware. This, our OT people really aren't so aware of cybersecurity. 
And rather than taking the safety analog, which I took, they took the quality analog, Kaizen being Japanese. They said, well, can we morph a quality mindset into cybersecurity? So finally, some IoT-centric projects. I'm not going to go through each of those, but you, this is just a subset. Um, I would just mention that Digiport is one that uh, Professor McCann's uh, looking after. She's coming on the panel, so if you're interested, um, she can talk about that. Peace Warms and Elliot, colleagues at uh, Warwick Loughborough and also uh, in UCL, uh, Nilifer Taptak. Uh, Sofiots, which is myself and, and Jamie Tooth and others and so on. And, and last but not least, TIMAS, which is actually a cyber ASAP project, which is we have a banner for upstairs, which my colleague uh, Tony Williams and myself are developing as a product on anomaly detection. So coming to the panel, um, Julie's going to be the, the chair of the panel. And the panel we're very pleased to, to have here. Hopefully you are all here. I think you are. So Rick Derbyshire from Orange Cyber Defence. Uh, Professor Vaise Go from Cranfield. Thank you. Victor Luff from Schneider and Emma Taylor from Razor Secure. So if you'd like to join us at the front, that would be great. Thank you.